Greetings, citizens, and welcome to another adventure of the Real Comic Heroes podcast. I'm Travis. And I'm Patrick. We're uh, going to be talking about uh, one of the granddaddies of the nerdy comic book world. Yeah, a little, a little known film. <laughs> yeah, the last time we were here, he was hanging out with some mole people. Yeah. <laughs> and we couldn't decide, were they naked or were they wearing... <laughs> yeah. Brown jumpsuits. Yeah, it, it's you. It, you'll never know. No, it's it's one of those mysteries yeah. that you know is lost to time. Yeah, it's like the uh, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a tootsie pop? Right. The world may never know. <laughs> and I think it's better that way. I think so. There's some mysteries that just need to go unsolved. So yeah, it looks like uh, well, in this movie, um, you can definitely tell when somebody's not wearing clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so. No worries on that front. Right. <laughs> we'll get into that later. Yeesh. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, we're talking about Superman, uh, the uh, OG Christopher Reeve. Yep, 1978. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, uh, we got uh, a very lengthy synopsis from IMDb. Oh, it just goes on and on. <laughs> this one, This one-sentence synopsis makes me... Wonder how they made an entire movie now. <laughs> I wonder if this was the pitch. Yeah. <laughs> All right, it's an orphan. He goes to the planet Earth and becomes a superhero. You're welcome. Let's make it. <laughs> it's essentially the story of Moses. Oh wow! Nah, everyone usually uh, associates Superman with Jesus. Yeah, that's that's typically he wants you know once he becomes Superman he's the uh, the savior you know the Jesus like savior yeah. I guess but. But his story, it, it's really close yeah. to the, you know, the the putting the baby in the basket and floating him down the river is, you know, almost exactly referenced, you know, in in putting him in the uh, in the rocket and sending him to Earth. So, so. Yeah, except uh, I don't think Moses had uh, Brando nagging him the whole way. <laughs> was, oh, that was brutal. I am surprised Superman did not become a psychopath. He was in that damn thing for like four years, it seemed like. Yeah, I think it was like three years. Oh, well, that kid was not three years old. That's true. <laughs> well, he was probably like what two? I don't, I don't know. All little kids look alike to me. I don't know. Anyway, we're jumping so, around. <laughs> yeah. Um. Um. Let's see. As far as the synopsis goes, an alien orphan is sent from his dying planet to Earth, where he grows up to become his adoptive home's. First and greatest superhero. So, pretty concise and, and accurate. Yeah, it doesn't really tell you much about the movie plot. No, because, you know, it, they could have talked about, you know, battles, Lex Luthor, who's, you know, attempting to blow up the, half the world, you know. Well, I think if they would have said, uh, this revolves around uh, Evil Mastermind's plot to buy up desert land in order to make money on property... I don't right. think it would uh, have the same uh, appeal. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what it was. It was just a land smuggling deal, kind of. Yeah, land fraud deal. Yeah. A little uh, over-exaggerated rocket action. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, hey, he gets points for uh, imagination. Yeah, at least uh, they were the first ones to do it. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so, yeah, this one uh, had a lot of notes on, so it's going to be hard to... Whittle it down. Yeah, I, I took a lot of notes too. I felt so like a, I guess. Yeah, I felt like it was a, like different movies I was watching. Yeah, um, I guess we could mention the the different acts, and because it it separates pretty evenly as far as like the first forty five minutes is all set up and leading to him, you know, going to Metropolis. Yeah, it's the whole backstory of Krypton or. Krypton, yeah, whatever the hell. Krypton, Krypton. Krypton. Yeah, uh, good enough, Brando. <laughs> yeah, that's. They don't call him one take Brando for nothing. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, that's the Godfather. Yeah, can't mess with him. I read that Brando had some of his lines like taped to the baby's diaper, so when he was holding the baby, it would he could just read his lines without having to memorize them. <laughs> Oh, that big uh, monologue he has when he's saying goodbye. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that is not surprising. 
I always heard horror stories from, uh, I think it was the Island of Dr. Moreau. Oh, yeah. There was like a whole story behind the movie. Right. And Brando was a big part of that. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah, he like kept trying to change what the movie was about. And... <laughs> yeah, he, he uh, I don't think everyone, anyone ever said no to him until it was too right. late. <laughs> Were you uh, about to say something? Oh, uh, I was just going to get into the act breaks. Okay. I'm talking about. So yeah. uh, basically the first act uh, would end at the point where he's finished his homeschooling with uh, Jarrell and <laughs> yeah. uh, flies off from the Crystal Mountain. Yep, that's what I've got. Okay. And then uh second act goes on until about the time that uh, Lex uses his dog whistle power. That's exactly what I've got too. So. To uh, lure Superman away. Yeah, so... That's good. At least our, our notes line up. Okay. So, well, right off the bat, I wanted to just quickly talk about like the opening on the Daily Planet, you know, Action Comics. Yeah. Thing. It, that was. It always throws me off. It's. Yeah. In the decade of the 1930s, even the great city of Metropolis was not spared the ravages of the worldwide depression. In the times of fear and confusion, the job of informing the public. Was the responsibility of the Daily Planet, a great metropolitan newspaper whose reputation for clarity and truth had become a symbol of hope for the city of Metropolis. I wasn't expecting that. I, it's one of those things that when I saw it a couple of years ago for the first time in a long time, I was like, "What the hell am I watching?" I know. I thought you... I thought I, <laughs> I thought I stumbled upon some kind of weird, uh, you know bonus feature on the DVD, you know, like kind of a behind the scenes or a, you know, making of kind of thing. Yeah, I thought you gave me so. a bootleg copy or something. <laughs> yeah. It's like the uh, China version of Superman or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was an odd way to start it off. And I'm assuming that's just in the DVD and it wasn't like that in the theater. I think it was. Really? I think it was, um, I read that, you know, the... That the voiceover is is like verbatim from what one of the old action comics like every issue started off with those same words. Oh. So, I near as I can tell, it was in there from the beginning. Well, I'll uh, break some more hearts here with okay. my uh, lack of knowledge. I always confuse the Superman theme and the Star Wars theme. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's because of the similar sequences and the. I don't know. It just I could always confuse the two. There are some similarities, and you've got you know it's they're both John yeah. Williams, you know, and it's I just now read before we we got on here that he used the same orchestra that he used for all six of the original Star Wars. Well, you know, all six of the Star Wars movies, um, and so yes, yeah, some of the some of the songs just kind of had similar themes or similar notes, you know. Yeah, I mean, so it always confused me cuz I'd start humming one thing and think it was another. And <laughs> yeah. It's like, "Oh wait, that's Superman." Damn it. <laughs> yeah. But uh I think uh, my first note was on the uh the billing of the characters. Yeah. I was I wasn't expecting it to have Christopher Reeves third. I mean, but at the time he had done, you know, one movie and I think one soap opera, so yeah, you know, there's there's no way Marlon Brando would have allowed, you know, taking second billing or even, you know. Yeah, I always thought they did like uh, when it was somebody like old, and, like established. They put uh, also starring or whatever. Yeah, it's always weird. It's like when do you get, you know, what do they call that? Like a um, featuring or yeah it's always it's weird as far as like when you get billed or where you're billed yeah you know and then margot kidder was like seventh or eighth I don't yeah she's she's way down there but i, I read that yeah, that was after at a certain point then they go alphabetically so yeah. it's like once you get your top three out of the way then everyone else was i guess alphabetically so gotcha oh and i'm gonna be saying christopher reeves Probably. Yeah, it is, it is Reeve. Yeah. So it's, but I think that's one of those common, you know, when you have George Reeves yeah. and and Christopher Reeve, 
you know. And I remember in the late 90s, kind of when they were talking about picking, you know, Superman back up, or I guess, you know, early 2000s, around the time that they were planning um, Superman Returns, everyone was, you know, threw Keanu Reeves' name into the mix, you know, <laughs> kind of post-Matrix, and it was a... Like, does he want to take on the the Superman curse, you know, because you had George Reeves who died, you know, and then obviously the the tragedy behind Christopher Reeves. So it was one of those, like, (laughs) kind of superstition, you know. That would be awful. Yeah. I can't imagine... Yeah, I'm sure it was just because in the in the end of the first Matrix movie he flies off. I think everyone uh, was like, "Oh, sh-, you know, oh shit, he needs to play Superman." So like, I am Superman. <laughs> That's how I'd picture it. <laughs> I know how to fly. <laughs> yeah. Hey, he can dodge bullets, I guess, in the Matrix. That's true. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. That, well, what was the other one? It was um, what's his face? He's like a nut job. Uh, I'm blanking on him. He was in Con Air. Oh, yeah. Cage? Yeah, Nicolas Cage. Nicolas Cage. Yeah, I mean, that was a close call we got with uh, the Tim Burton-directed Superman Lives with Nicolas Cage. So, Is that the one that and, Kevin Smith was tied to? Yeah, he did a draft, you know. Okay. <laughs> so his little version of it is worth watching the... I think it's the first evening with Kevin Smith where he talks about, you know, where the the whole idea be, behind elements of his script came from, and it's really entertaining. <laughs> That'd be cool. Um, yeah, there were a ton of people like that were considered for the role of Superman. Um, we can I can go through some of them now, or we can talk about it later after the review, but. Oh, uh, you can go now. I mean, we've already been talking about it, so... Yeah. Um, I mean, just it seemed like they had everybody was either considered or, like, their name was thrown around, like, you know, Burt Reynolds, Al Pacino, uh, Nick Nolte, uh, Robert Redford, Paul Newman, <laughs> you know, like, everybody. And it's like, you look at that lit, list, and it's like, none of these people, you know, would have looked right, you know, um, Sylvester Stallone wanted it. Uh, <laughs> I guess Warren Beatty was considered, and he, out of all of them, he could have done it. I think, because I imagine in his like youth, he probably had that good like square jawed, you know, heroic, you know, yeah, kind of look. So he could have probably done it. But it's just crazy how, you know, how close it could have come to someone else other than this unknown, you know, Christopher Reeve. So. That's weird. I can't picture any of those people doing that. I know. It's it's insane. I always, um, speaking about casting, uh, for the new Batman v Superman, Yeah, I always thought they were going to go with like uh, John Hamm as Batman. Yeah, his name was thrown around for everybody. Like, they wanted him to play Superman for a while, and yeah, Batman. and I figured he was too old to play Superman, but he could yeah. do a older Bruce Wayne. Yeah, he could have done Bruce Wayne pretty well. I, I think we'll still see him in something in the yeah. next couple of years. Someone did a uh, like a fan art uh, rendition of John Hamm as Cable, like in the <laughs> next in nice. uh, for for the Deadpool sequel. If he was okay, uh, you know, made him up to look like Cable, and and it would work. Like, so I don't know. I like to see uh, that John Magna Magniola guy, or whatever his name. Oh is. yeah, Joe Joe Manganiello. Joe. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> I can never remember his name. I, I only know it because he's been on Nerdist and like he, uh, you know, literally said, "Here's how you say my name." So ah, uh, gotcha. I'll have to watch that or listen to it, whatever. Um, but yeah, I always thought he'd be good in some kind of superhero role, uh, superhero role. Yeah, they were talking about him for Superman before Henry Cavill got it, which I didn't think he was right for yeah. Superman. He's got the build for sure. Yeah. But and then they were talking about him for Batman, which I could see maybe a little bit more. Uh, I could see him as Batman slightly more than him as Superman. But 
there's plenty of other big actually now that Deadpool's come out and Hollywood now thinks, you know, we have to make R rated superhero movies, you know, D C has a character called Lobo who's like a bounty hunter, biker, oh, yeah. a- alien biker kind of guy. And I think yeah. he would be perfect for Lobo. Yeah. So I like that. Yeah. I forgot about that guy. <laughs> He's got that yeah. sweet, like, flying motorcycle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I only know him from the Superman animated TV show. Like, I've read him in a few issues of comics here or there, but I mostly just know him from the, yeah. the cartoon. But I liked him in the anime. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. He's good in small doses. So. I will say that the music is so good that it makes the credits credits exciting. Yeah. You know, but... Even with the cheesy sound effects. <laughs> yeah. The whooshing noises. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about Krypton? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose to say it like that since, you know, obviously Marlon Brando can do no wrong, so and it must be. And who's to say how you really say it? Exactly. I mean, he's the only one we really heard talk yeah. about it. I mean... It's not like Superman really knows. Right. Although you'd think he'd call it Krypton, too, since Jarrell was you'd talking think. in his head for three years. <laughs> um, I never really dug the uh, the ice fortress look uh, of yeah. of Krypton. Like, it's depressing. Yeah. And it's like, is it supposed to be cold? You know, is it meant to be icy, or is it just... Yeah, I thought it was just crystals. Light. Yeah. And, I, yeah, I have no good reason as to why they only use crystals for yeah it seems like every kind of building and furniture even their yeah, clothes just, match the I don't know. yeah it's weird just never really felt the uh the look of of krypton and it's, just, it's okay for what it is i guess but just i think i've seen better in the animated series where it's almost like uh krypton looks like a futuristic rome Yes. And, yeah. Uh, I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, I like the animated version of of Krypton. Yeah. Well, so far the animated version's uh, winning. Yeah. Yeah. So far. Yeah. <laughs> Who needs live action? Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I I do love that they use you know, ev- everyone has their family or house symbol that they wear. Yeah. And you know that the. That that's where Superman gets his symbol. It's it's the House of L, you know. That, yeah. Okay. Which um, I guess was not really established in the comics, so it was huh. created in this movie that all the you know heads of the houses would wear this wear their symbols, and uh, and that that's where Superman got it from. So so and that's kind of become you know canonical. Since since this movie, so the vote must be unanimous, Jorel. It has therefore now become your decision. You alone will condemn us if you wish, and you alone will be held responsible by me. Join us. You have been known to disagree with the council before. Yours could become an important voice in the new order, second only to my own. I offer you a chance for greatness, Jorel. Take it. Join us. You will bow down before me, Jorel. I swear it. No matter that it takes an eternity, you will bow down before me. Both you and then one day, your heirs. 
What do you think about, you know, we're, we're just thrown into this trial of, of General Zod. Like, what do you think about that? Uh, I didn't realize that, well, at first it, I was like, oh, okay, it must be the one that he fights Zod. So I thought we were watching <laughs> yeah. that movie, and I was... Uh, yeah. So it made sense in that context, but then once I realized we weren't watching that movie, it was really weird. It is a little strange, but I kind of go with it, you know. Um, I like that we don't necessarily get all the details, or, you know, they're not... We don't we don't need to be shown that they let her, tried to lead a... A revolution, yeah. you know, because um, they explain it pretty well that, mm-hmm. you know, they they failed it at overthrowing the, you know, the government and now they're on trial. And um, so that, that part works works for me. Um, See, I thought it would jump into like a sort of a forum talking about evidence of the planet's destru- destruction or something. Right. I thought it was going to be more. I thought it would have made more sense to talk about that. Then yeah, I mean, we get a little, sequel. <laughs> right. Yeah. We get a little bit of that, you know, Jarrell trying to explain to, to everyone yeah. what's going on with the planet, but obviously they quickly, you know, try to silence him, so Yeah, like they're like, Oh, you're one of our greatest minds, but uh we just don't believe you this time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the data just we don't agree the data's perfect, but we don't agree with your conclusion. Right. Yeah, it's like oh, if the date is perfect, uh, how can you not come up with a similar conclusion? Yeah, it's there's no good reason that they don't you know take you know that they don't respect any, you know his his uh, ideas. So. They wouldn't even let him leave the planet. I guess, and he he says it later about their vanity and their you know opinions of themselves was so high that they didn't think that they were they, that they thought they were indestructible it's what Jarrell tells Kal-El later so I guess it makes sense that they were just too high and mighty to consider that they might ever that their planet might ever be destroyed so what are they thinking it's made out of crystals you hit a tuning fork right? <laughs> bam yeah. oh, freaking Kryptons yeah Krypton Kryptonite. Hey, it kind of worked. Kryptonite. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm with Brando. <laughs> Everyone start talking like Brando. Krypton. <laughs> that sounds so stupid. Right. Krypton is where it's at. We're going to have to get like a Team Krypton hashtag going or something. Yeah. <laughs> team Krypton versus Team Krypton. Yeah. Uh, freaking Brando. Um, what else did I... Oh. <laughs> I noticed there's like a lot of hula hoop action going on. Yeah. Like, is it supposed to be futuristic or something? I guess so. It's supposed to look like it's two rings, you know, spinning around each other when it's really just one object, you know, rotating. But it, it looks kind of as if these two rings are spinning against each other. So Yeah, it was just, I don't know, it was weird. <laughs> yeah. Um. So what did you think about the uh, Phantom Zone depiction? I don't like it. <laughs> I I don't like the the prism, you know. Yeah, I, I never understood it. It's like yeah, I like the gun version where it zaps you into a dimension. <laughs> yeah, I, right. I can understand that. Yeah, but yeah. Being trapped inside a mirror and floating around in space, I don't. The only purpose that serves is when you get to Superman two, yeah. and you know, because essentially they're just floating through space. You know, I I always like to I like the Phantom Zone when it's another like plane or another, you know, maybe it's like a teleportation to another planet, you know, where you're you it's just a prison cell. But, you know, so the idea that it's just they're locked into this prism just doesn't doesn't really do anything for me. Okay. It's, you know, it's intense when, like, they can see it coming for them, you know, and you don't know what's going to happen. And um, the effect of it, like, everything starts spinning and they're just sucked into this prism just kind of looks cheesy. But um, (laughs) overall, it just doesn't really work for me. Okay, I think we have a Brando moment. Yeah. What are you calling the zone? The Phantom Zone. Okay. I thought you called it the (laughs) Fathom Zone. The Fathom Zone. <laughs> I was like, am I wrong this whole time? <laughs> the Fathom Zone? <laughs> okay, I just heard you're wrong. Gotcha. <sighs> Although that would be a cool one. 
Yeah. You can't even fathom it. Right. It's so fathom. Oh, man. I think it's too late and my ears don't work. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Da, da, da. I'm trying to skip uh, a little bit forward. I already, yeah. I already started, well, I don't know. Did you want to talk about the really spiky escape pod he's got? <laughs> um, again, I kind of lumped that into the whole crystal thing. And, yeah. and from a production design standpoint, I don't like it. I've never liked the spiky ball, you know. Yeah. I like a good old-fashioned rocket ship, you know. It is kind of cool, though, when it enters the atmosphere and burns up. Yeah, that's 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 all right. But, yeah, I mean, this kid's surrounded by crystals. He's going to poke his eye out eventually. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, like, literally surrounded with all these pointy crystals. Right, yeah. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> and just think, those are his those are his friends and those uh-huh. are his toys for three years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and apparently he does not take a dump the whole time. Because <laughs> he should have looked like a mess when he got oh, out Oh, man, of what if... What if the his you know pod opened up and and Martha and Jonathan just passed out from the stench? <laughs> yeah, because oof, super dumps. Yeah, I don't know. One of those crystals probably taught him how to use the flusher on the thing. Probably, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but man, that's, that's a space peanut. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I I love the uh, the Brando and I think her name is Susanna York. Uh, playing, I might have that wrong, but um, the lady playing, you know, his mother. But I really enjoy their performances. You know, ma- obviously Brando has all the the monologues, and you know he delivers them really well. Um, it's hard to read off a moving baby. That's true. <laughs> he should have got an Academy Award just for being able to read his lines. It takes talent. Yeah. We will never leave you, even in the face of our death. The richness of our lives shall be yours. All that I have, all that I've learned, everything I feel, all this and more, I I bequeath you, my son. You will carry me inside you. All the days of your life. You will make my strength your own. See my life through your eyes. As your life will be seen through mine. The son becomes the father, and the father the son. This is all I... All I can send you. Um, I I I think the uh, the destruction of Krypton really works. It's uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing, really. I mean, just the uh, the the blending of the effects and the the music and the you know people screaming and just all that I think really works. Yeah, it was um. I, I wasn't expecting it to look as good as it did. Yeah. I thought it was going to look more... I thought it was going to look a lot like the Death Star. Sure, where the <laughs> planet just explodes. Yeah. So I was kind of uh, pleasantly surprised by it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, Superman's flying through space. Yeah. Um, getting his knowledge from good old dad. Which I kind of like that. I mean, it makes sense if he's going to have to travel all the way to Earth. You know, he might as well be... You know, start getting the the education, I guess, or just you know, I, I take that. I mean, obviously he's a baby; he's not going to understand a lot of it. But maybe his Kryptonian physiology lets him absorb that knowledge. You know, I mean, obviously, yeah. When he's when he's young, Clark, he doesn't know where he's from. So apparently, some of that knowledge <laughs> didn't really, you know, he zoned out his old was, man. Was, <laughs> He did a lot of drugs from ages 12 to 18, so. Yeah, no, I just think he zoned him out after the first year. Yeah. Have... Probably what happens is when he returns to the, you know, Fortress of Solitude, 
a lot of that information is probably unlocked, you know, once he... Yeah, that could be. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Terrell uh, uh, hypnotized him? Basically, so, yeah. I guess yeah. put him under <laughs> a spell and, and uh, all that information went into his subconscious until... Man, yeah. he must have had some effed up dreams. Oh, yeah. Oh, what is it? I'm I'm still confused as to how Superman ages. Um, because I mean, it seems like he gets to a certain point and just stops. But yeah. until then, he's growing like a normal child. Yeah, I think it could be like when they hit, you know, not not when they hit puberty, but when they hit like a certain age, maybe then they, you know, their their aging slows. So they're so evolved they can hit their peak physical condition and then halt it. Kind of? Maybe. Okay. Although, it could just be, you know, because of, you know, the Earth atmosphere and the yellow sun, you know, on him, it, you know, he ages different. And, and really, yeah. he doesn't age any differently from what we're shown a normal person. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know, is that... That part always, met, like, confused me, just... Do you mean just in general yeah. or in this movie? No, in general. Like, okay. Because I always do. He grew up and went to high school. Yeah. And you know, got a job at the Daily Planet, and it seemed like he followed a natural timeline. Yeah, I don't. And then he just yeah. seems to stop, and Batman's like a hundred years old, and oh. Superman still like looks like he's in his thirties. Um. I know he slows like he's not as fast to age. Yeah. At some point, but it seems like. Up until that point, he's aging like normal. Sure. Yeah, maybe it's like from ages, you know, infancy till age 30, maybe it's it's normal for a human. And then beyond that, maybe it's like he ages one year for every five to ten Earth years. You know, who knows? So uh, we get to one of the more uh, uh, surprising moments of the movie for me. Yeah. Uh, when... Uh, Pa and Ma find a uh, good old Clark. Sure. And uh, he <laughs> comes out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> free balling like there's no tomorrow. Hey. I'm like, dude, Jarrell, you couldn't pack an extra pair of underpants for this kid? <laughs> what what happened to that diaper you were reading off of? Yeah, I mean, he had a blanket. Can't, yeah. Isn't there a home ec class in that spaceship where he could teach him how to make some underpants? <laughs> I just was so confused as to why we had to see that. And it's weird because we've now had a naked, you know, Cal L in two movies. They did the same thing in Man of Steel with the, you know, naked baby. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can understand if it was a baby. But yeah, that's true. This I kid's going to be starting elementary school next year. <laughs> it is a little jarring, but. You know. I was like, whoa, wait a second here. Why are we yeah. getting full on everything? Well, and the <laughs> weird thing was, I was. Uh, I was attaching the trailer for Superman to, you know, the previous episode. And obviously, you know, I have to look around on YouTube just to find the right trailer and everything. So I watched it just to make sure. And they show that part in the trailer, like, oh, yeah. which I saw it afterwards. Know, yeah. Because I wanted to check out the trailer. And I yeah. Was like, oh, they put it in the trailer. <laughs> it's, it's bizarre, but I guess, you know, it's not even red 70s. Band. It's like, yeah. <laughs> well, heads I up. Mean, ultimately, it's like it doesn't matter it's not a big deal to see a naked you know i guess he, he's not a baby you know no. that, that's the weird part is that he's a naked like two or three year old he's like five that kid can do addition and subtraction i think <laughs> <laughs> that was just messed up i was like it's weird it, but yeah it was i think it was so messed up because i wasn't expecting it sure like yeah i was just like oh okay like i was expecting a baby in there Right. And then out comes this kid walking around going, hey, what's up? Let me scratch my yeah. junk. Want me to lift this tractor for you? Yeah. Well, at least they put something around him for that. Yeah, they wrapped him up pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Um, so, yeah. I'm, uh, now I understand why he wears, he flies around in underpants. Yeah. So it's actually a step up for him. <laughs> he's just been flying around with just a cape. Yeah, he's, he's got to make up for lost time. Comes out, he's like, "Yeah, hey, nature intended. All right, yeah. let's do this. Freaking hippie. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay. Anyway. So uh, <laughs> after that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wrote down, uh, what the F, naked Kid Clark. 
Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. Um, uh, yeah. Let's see. I, uh, for me, the uh, young Clark kind of seems like he doesn't seem that much younger than Christopher Reeve. <laughs> no. like, like he's supposed to be eighteen, and you know Christopher Reeve, who was twenty six here, was supposed to be playing Clark at thirty. So you know they're only like in reality only a couple years different. You know? And it just I don't know. It always weirds me out seeing the young Clark because it's like he's in there for a couple minutes. Yeah, he doesn't look that much like Christopher Reeve, and apparently they spent a lot of time and a lot of makeup to make the this guy look like <laughs> Christopher Reeve and you can see his like fake nose oh. and it's it the weird part is it's it doesn't look like Christopher Reeve's nose like yeah yeah it's like why give him a fake nose if it's not going to match you know yeah at no point so, did i think oh that must be the same person <laughs> yeah and i guess like uh, Christopher Reeve did did all the voiceover for Young Clark, so at least they sounded the same. Mm-hmm. It's just I don't know. It's just weird. <laughs> I think they should have got someone that looked younger and then played him in his you know sixteen, seventeen years old. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I was just I I, the whole time I was just like, all right, let's get the Christopher. Reeve. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they had the weird running scene with the train. That, yeah, that's odd, but yeah. I, it might have been it might have been cool at the time. Maybe. Today it doesn't look very good. I, I can't imagine that too many movies before this had had tried to do the super speed. Yeah. So that would have probably been fairly new. And yeah, maybe it worked then. But um, And I didn't realize that's where Lois first saw Clark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's one of those kind of weird like throw in scenes that, that she sees him on the train yeah. from the train. Um, and then that's actually, the mother is played by one of the Lois Lanes that was in, um, in the Adventures of Superman. And then the father was Kirk Allen, who played Superman in like the 1948, um, one of the, like Superman versus the Adam, Adam men or something like that. So (laughs) they kind of use those, you know, actors to, you know, just little cameos, kind of, kind of a nice touch. Gotcha. Yeah, I know. You can do all these amazing things, and sometimes you think that you will just go bust unless you can tell people about it, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, every time I get the football, I can make a touchdown. <laughs> that's for sure. Every time. Yeah. I mean, is it showing off and somebody's doing the things he's capable of doing? Is, is no. a bird showing off when it flies? No. No, now, you listen to me. When you first came to us, we thought that people would come and take you away because... When they found out, you know, the things you could do, and that worried us a lot. But then a man gets older, and he thinks very differently, and things get very clear. And there's one thing I do know, son, and that is you are here for a reason. I don't know whose reason, whatever the reason is, you know, maybe it's because... Uh, I don't know, it's... Uh... But I do know one thing. It's not to score touchdowns. Huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Um, I really dig the uh, the Kents here. I mean, I, I'm always a sucker for uh, for Jonathan Kent. Um, just him, you know, just the simple like couple lines that he has telling Clark, you know, that he knows his purpose isn't to throw footballs, and you know that that line is just is kind of iconic, and it I don't know. Just that's the the Kents themselves are just such a big part of what makes Superman Superman. Yeah. You know, like we don't get much of them in this movie, and I don't think we need a lot of the Kents. No, they're probably but, all dead after he gets out of the cave. Right. <laughs> I didn't remember them uh, being that old. Yeah. Um, although he is sending his part of his paycheck, yeah. you know, home to his mom, so she's at least alive. Yeah. Either that or he's doing a Norman Bates thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, that'd be so creepy. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that ship messed him up with drill in his head. Right. <laughs> I guess one of the, uh, probably the reason that Nick Nolte didn't get the job was he wanted to play Clark Kent as, like, being very schizophrenic. 
<laughs> I don't know what purpose that would serve, but... Well, that would give him his split personalities, I guess, for yeah, secret I guess identity. So. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. Um, so, let's see. Are we... Uh, we're getting to the crystal throw and fortress building. Yeah. I think it's a poor choice to make the crystal green. Yeah. So I, I think you instantly associate it with kryptonite. Yeah. So it's like they could have made it, just made it a white crystal or a blue crystal, you know. Yeah, just something other than green, basically. Yeah, because I always used to think, especially because it glows, you know. Yeah. So I think that's just a weird, weird choice. I thought I remembered it being a black crystal in one of the animated Maybe. Series. I know they've played around with different colored crystals. Yeah. Like red, red kryptonite gives him, like... Super rage. Yeah, it brings out the worst in him, and then there's... There's red, there's green, or it might be yellow. I think there is, if that helps calm them down or something. Might be, yeah. So they're, they're, they could have done a black crystal, I don't know. Uh, so basically it's like rainbow bright. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Um, I like that they just kind of quickly show him going north and, you know, <clears throat> the the lead up to the the whole Fortress of Solitude thing. I'm glad they don't spend too much time on that, just because it's kind of weird. Like, they don't explain. Maybe is he just being? Does he have a sense that he needs to go north, or is there something pulling him? Like, they don't. Yeah, I, I don't know if he got into his old spaceship stuff and found something that. You know, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of hard to figure that part out. Yeah. Maybe it's telling him to find the most desolate place on the earth. Yeah. So I'm assuming it's like Antarctica or something. They're not. Oh, yeah, no, that's south. So I guess Arctic Arctic Circle. Yeah. yeah. Um, and an unfortunate part is now when I watch the movie and I see, you know, young Clark stepping on like the little icebergs or whatever, I think of the movie Elf, and I think <laughs> I keep waiting for like Mr. Norwal, you know, to pop up out of the water or. Nice. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> Bye, buddy. I hope you find your parents. <laughs> that was a good Norwal. Yeah. Bad. Um, yeah, he had to go through the candy cane forest and all that BS. Yeah. Then he came out the Holland Tunnel. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah, the whole, like, he chucks that green thing and magically yeah. a giant structure builds. and Yeah. Uh, there's more crystals inside i guess that i think it's the way i read it is the green crystal is like a blueprint almost like dna like it's got the mapping for everything kryptonian you know the how to build the fortress how you know how to grow the particular crystals that he later uses for communicating with jor-el like like it's got everything you know so that's that's how I take it. Yeah. I don't know if that's what they intended, yeah. but I mean, we get the uh, giant Jarrell head talking to him. Yeah, <laughs> which I'm I'm on board with. Yeah. I like that he can communicate with him and everything, and that's obviously how he gets the the rest of his education and everything. Um, but then it has that weird transition where it it switches to the um, I guess kind of crystal mask of. Jor-El or of Marlon Brando, but it's all like, you know, rough shaped and it's just weird. Like, yeah, but uh, um, yeah, he uh, spends an amazing 12 years in that place. Yeah, which I always, you know, seems like a really excessive amount of time for Clark to be gone. Yeah, I mean, he basically ditched his mom for 12 years after she lost yeah. her husband. And somehow comes away with enough credibility to join a newspaper in essentially in New York, you know, for one of like the the country's best, you know, newspapers. Yeah. It's like, what are his qualifications? Twelve years ago, he worked at his high school newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's probably got guess, uh, Jarrell has a way of forging yeah documents or something. Probably. Yeah, because I mean, yeah, I, I never quite got that. So, yeah. So see, um, it almost sounds like when the um, chief is talking that he basically gave him a story and then watched him type, and that was it. 
Yeah, because that's that's his big selling point is that you know that Clark can type. You know, how, I forget if he says how fast. Yeah, I think he just says he's the fastest typist he's he's ever seen. That's right. And he writes a good pro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess we're pretty much at the end of Act One, and you want to talk about just the the scene where he flies off and. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I like that we get a pretty quick look at him in the costume. They don't, you know, give us a real close up, and he's moving the whole time, so it's not, you know. It's not the hero shot, but I like that we see him in costume briefly as he flies off. Um, and obviously the music is, is swelling, and you get the great line from from Jor-El talking about how you know they can be a great people if they wish to be, and all that. So just one of those, another one of those uh, kind of iconic quotes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we uh, he flies off, and then. It sort of goes into point of view. Yeah, which I think is kind of, you know, kind of fun just seeing the uh, the Daily Planet through Jimmy Olsen's lens. Yeah, and uh, what is it? Uh, they got um, <laughs> it immediately struck me that there were typewriters everywhere. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow, yeah. But um, it sort of leads into a running joke throughout the movie. Oh yeah, Lois Lane and her spelling. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't understand. Is that <laughs> why are they so adamant about that? I don't know. I guess maybe they just want her to have some kind of quirky habit or not habit, but just you know, a little character flaw. I don't know. And she's like you know the best reporter, but she can't spell. Yeah, and all the, it makes me wonder. Like, I know she's doing the crime beat or the city beat or whatever, but yeah, it's like rapist, uh, bloodletting. She talks yeah. about like uh, nursing home nursing home orgies. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like drugs, sex and maniac. Sex, yeah, <laughs> it's like what the hell is this chick writing? Yeah, Razier. I mean, it's like yeah. There's always just a bizarre word she's trying to not spell right. incorrectly. I was like, okay, this lady likes to write some fun stories, I guess. Yeah. Because at the same time, she's interviewing some guy about land deals. So yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's kind of far from being the city beat yeah. when she's out in, you know, I think it's, it's supposed to be somewhere in California, like the, yeah, the desert. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was just like, okay. Is she going to Nevada to talk about prostitution? What's going on over here? <laughs> yeah. Although I think, let's see, he puts, uh, Perry White puts Clark on the city beat. Mm-hmm. So does that boot her out of it? So maybe that's why she's. Yeah, maybe. Going out to the desert, you know. So Clark's writing about orgies and... Right, yeah. <laughs> all that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was just... I don't know. It, it seemed to be a running joke that... Yeah, like, yeah. Okay. Um, I want to definitely want to talk about, you know, we get to finally, basically, we get our first look at Christopher Reeve in the movie. It's like 45 minutes in and, and we're just now seeing him. Yeah. Um, And this is one of those, like, they just nailed it. The, you know, Christopher Reeve is a genius when it comes to playing Clark as the fool. Oh yeah. You know it's, and there's little things that he does that kind of show you how brilliant, you know, he's playing this character. From the, like the mugging when he's yeah. playing, you know, playing it all scared and and nervous to like once he's caught the bullet, you know, he kind of smirks as Lois walks away and. Um, I like how high pitched he gets. I know. And he's like, oh, Lois. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. We should yeah. give him everything we have. <laughs> he, he he hams it up a little bit. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> he's just like, oh, Lois, do what he said. Yeah. <laughs> give him everything you got. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I love it. Yeah. Uh, I like when he's uh, applauding the the robber for like, you know, good for you for turning over a new leaf, you know, when he... Yeah. So it's... But I, I just I could watch him play Clark Kent all day. Um, yeah, I think you really get to see it after his interview as Superman. Yes, that's I wanted to yeah talk about that yeah. for sure. Just the because you see it physically, yeah. he he broadens his shoulders and he stands up taller when he's you know you know then when he takes his glasses off you know he he's thinking about telling Lois that it's it's really him. But then you see the look of disappointment on his face when he realizes that he 
can't reveal himself. And it's like you can kind of see that he doesn't want to pretend that he's, you know, he's he is Clark Kent. So it's it's a mistake to say that he's pretending to be Clark Kent. But well, you know, he, he, the mild mannered aspect of yeah, you know that. I mean, in name he's Clark Kent, but the way he's right. acting isn't Clark Kent. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, it's just it's I don't know it's it's probably and I I could say this now it's probably one of the best parts of the movie is his performance as both, you know, Clark Kent and Superman. So, Oh, yeah. Yeah, that scene was in particular because it, it showed the, how he physically transforms and you get yeah. to tell the voice change and speech pattern change. and Right. Uh, it, it just struck me as pretty impressive when I saw it. Yeah. Um, um, and then we go to one of my favorite characters in the movie, Otis. Oh, you mean the sheriff from uh, James Bond? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Similar, like, yeah. Just the goofy, dim-witted. Yep. Yeah. That's immediately what I thought when I saw him. I'm like, oh, yeah. here comes the bumbling idiot. I love I love Otis. Oh, yeah, I like him way better. He's, you yeah. know, he's, he's almost like near Jar Jar levels of buffoonery. Yeah. But I just, I absolutely love him. Um, He's got a good scene in the third act that I like. Yeah, it's probably one of my favorites too. So we'll, yeah. we'll save that. Um, but I, I like the introduction of Lex, Lex Luthor, Otis, and Miss Tessmacher, mm-hmm. um, and the three of them like playing off of each other is, I think it's it's brilliant. Oh, yeah. You know, I love the <laughs> Miss Tessmacher giving him giving Lex all kinds of shit. Like you know. <laughs> Do you know what your fa- what my father said to me? Get out, you know. Just you know, she's she's snarky and she's, you know, just Yeah, she's not as beaten down by him as you think she would be. Right. Um and I think she's a lot smarter than she lets on. Oh yeah. She fixes uh, goofball's mistakes, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. So they're I mean, yeah, they're uh they're some of my favorite performances in the movie. Um, just because they're fun and you know it's it's lighthearted like everything that we see from from Lex it's it's not you know we don't see much of the the evil side of him uh, well, we <laughs> uh, we do but not not near as much as we see the the goofy side uh, that they play yeah you know him and his bumbling you know little associates you know but uh, it totally works for me yeah, he's pretty cold blooded with that trick uh, passageway with the cop tail and otis yeah yeah <laughs> i was like oh damn <laughs> um i kind of wish we got some sense or some reason of why they're underground i mean he explains kind of why they live underground but yeah. it almost seems like they've been like he's been exiled from humanity or <laughs> like he's on the run but based on like the end of the movie there's no sense of like that he's a known criminal you know, like he, they have to explain, he has to explain to the warden who he is, you know, it's like no one, no one's ever heard of Lex Luthor. So, yeah, it's hard to figure out. It's like, obviously the cops are on to Otis and are trying yes. to get to Lex. So he's got to be known somewhat, but maybe nobody's been able to pin him on anything. Yeah, I guess that could be genius it. and all that. So right. maybe that's why he's not as well known as he should be. Yeah. Um, and then the underground thing, I think, is just, I don't know, it's almost like he's thinks he's too good to be around other people, or... Could uh, be. I mean, yeah, his ego is definitely, you know, massive, and he does he does tell uh, Miss Tessmacher, you know, she has a Park Avenue address, you know, <laughs> yeah. so it does kind of come down to real estate, you know, that's, yeah. that's what his motivations are, like he, to him, you know, he even says, why would I pay, you know, through the nose for what, you know... For a couple of square feet of an apartment or something like that. Yeah. So, uh, it made me think of uh, Ninja Turtles too. Yeah, uh, when they get to the subway station. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, but I liked it. It was cool. He kept it class. Uh, kept it classy. Right. Uh, uh, so then we get to the uh, pretty much to the helicopter rescue. Yeah. Unless you have anything before then. No, that's pretty much where I was going to with the helicopter catch. Um, which that scene, that whole sequence still holds oh, up yeah. for me. I was impressed. 
Yeah. I mean, he catches Lois and then is holding as he is in the air. Somehow he can still catch a helicopter with one hand. I know. And not it, move. <laughs> the helicopter just stays perfectly level. Yeah. yeah. Well, I always, that, it, the physics don't match up. No, not at all. <laughs> it's like, that's great. He can defy gravity, but he doesn't budge. <laughs> yeah. Like, what is he pushing off against? I don't. But yeah. But aside from that, it, yeah, it, it looks like he's physically holding both a helicopter and Lois and fly up. Yeah. And just the, uh, like she sells it with the sheer terror, you know, just in the in the sequence where it's leading up to him rescuing her, yeah. and I mean just the the music beats and the him running across the street and popping the shirt open, like that whole scene sequence is it's iconic and it's you know it's been done now, like you know it's been parodied, it's been you know it's been an homage, it's been referenced you know in so many things that. But, well, they even parodied the whole phone booth thing. Yeah, yeah. Because he ran. I do by. like the phone booth bit. Yeah. So, and then he just runs through a turnstile and magics his. They, well, he magics his suit on all the time in this movie. Yeah, <laughs> that the the turnstile one doesn't bother me. Yeah. But the one where he's flying down yeah. and he just magically his clothes apparate, you know, onto <laughs> him. It's like that one. I don't know. Yeah, he well, he must have talked to Harry Potter at one point, and right, yeah, just said uh, Akio, Akio, Superman onesie, <laughs> yeah, super onesie. Ne- uh, the best I can figure is he's so fast that he's yeah. able to remove his clothes in the blink of an eye. Yeah, it's super. And bad. we just <laughs> see the transition without you know the yeah. seeing how it happens, I guess. So and apparently, he stuffs his existing clothes somewhere unknown. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, he probably just, you know, burnt, incinerates him with his heat vision. <laughs> That's a waste. Yeah. I thought the Kents taught him better than that. <laughs> I always liked the, uh, it was one of the first SNL um, appearances with uh, The Rock, or Dwayne Johnson, kind of back when he was still kind of wrestling and, you know, mm-hmm. had only done a few movies. And they did a great bit with him. He was playing Clark Kent. But you could tell that he had the Superman costume on underneath his clothes. Uh-huh. And like everybody in the office was like, you know, they they all could tell because it was like this massive hulking guy, you know, with a bit of red sticking out from underneath his, you know, shirt collar and just, you know, um, they all teasing him about, you know, being Superman. He was getting angry that he wasn't Superman. He was like smashing all the office furniture. And it's awesome. really brilliant. Yeah. yeah. See, I always just pictured that Superman threw his clothes, and yeah. there's a bunch of dapper-looking homeless men in suits. <laughs> right. He's helping as he yeah, throws his clothes. It, yeah. There's just all these guys walking around in his old suits. Right. So that's my that's what I had pictured. Maybe that's what half of his salary goes to is just uh, <laughs> paying some you know some tailor just to <laughs> keep him in clothes. Uh, not Superman. Yeah. Um. I like that. Uh, I mean, obviously, you need a this, for Superman to work. You need him to make kind of make his first appearance in front of the whole world. You know, so I like that it's in a in front of a crowd of people. It's it's not like him saving people from the shadows, like yeah, you know, like a Batman or you know, I've been watching a lot of Daredevil. So it's like yeah. you know, it's I'm glad that he's he's out in the open and there's photos of him on the newspaper. You know. See, so. I thought it was going to be more like how it is with The Flash, where they just see a blur. Sure. Because I, I think I remember seeing some animated series about the red-blue blur or something, they called them. Well, that was in Smallville. They called him, for like two seasons, they called him the red-blue blur or something That's like right. that. And then they shortened it to the blur. I hated that. That was, that was some of the worst. Like, I, I don't know. That was terrible choice in, in Smallville to keep up that charade of yeah. like calling him the blur and all that was awful. The whole, I mean, Smallville lasted way too long. As I agree. I've always said, I've always said that if you take Smallville, like all 10 seasons, you know, you could compress it down to like five to six seasons worth of really excellent, you know, storytelling, but you've got to wade through four plus seasons of filler episodes and, and, you know, yeah. cheesy writing. So 
Yeah, I like that Lex Luthor. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> oh, both Lex Luthers, dad and son. Right. Yeah. Or Luthers, I should say, not Lex. Luthers. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, it was kind of interesting to see Lex Luthor's uh, side of the story. Yeah. Cause I, yeah, I, I like him. I never really thought about it up until then. Sure. I just assumed nobody paid attention to him as a kid. <laughs> right. But uh, so yeah, we're just. Uh, the helicopter, so then he saves... Yeah. He goes from that to then saving a cat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he's got, it's kind of a... It's, I wouldn't call it a montage, because it's not... It's like, it's fully, you know, full sequences of him... Let's see, they do the... Uh, oh, the next one is, like, he busts the the burglar yeah. who's climbing up the building, you know, and we get some pretty cheesy puns, like, you know, the going up... You know, he's flying down, he's like going down and then going up and you know, so some of that's a little cheesy, but I think that works for Superman. Like he is the he tells corny jokes, you know, that's that that fits, you know. I like the um, sequence though, because at first I yeah. thought it was gonna be like Batman. Like, you know, it's really a horizontal floor that they're just standing on. <laughs> and he yeah. was just gonna like walk down it. But right. he actually flew down and then it showed the shot from inside the office of him catching the burglar. Right. Which was kind of cool, I thought. Yeah. But, uh, back to that cat. Yes. Did the mom hit the daughter? Totally. Okay. Here you go, miss. Gee, thanks, mister. Oh. Bye, Frisky. Come on now. Bye. Bye. Mommy, mommy. Frisky was stuck in the tree. His man swooped at it in the sky and gave him to I told you to stop telling lies. I've always uh, thought that was weird. <laughs> wow, she basically just slapped her for telling her uh, telling her mom that some man saved her cat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, what it, the fuck? <laughs> uh, and that's one of those I remember seeing that as a kid and being really confused. Like Superman saves his girl's cat, and then she goes inside and gets smacked. You know, I was like where are you at, it's, Superman? Yeah, like we gotta crack down on this domestic, you know, violence and child abuse. Don't, like, don't tell me you didn't hear it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, and I guess it's like it's the seventies. <laughs> yeah, and maybe it's like a, I guess it's a commentary, like because we're shown, you know, young Lois says she saw someone doing, you know, supernatural things, and she was like praised by her parents for like, oh, they, you know. Got quite quite an imagination, you know. And then we're seeing, we're shown thirty years later, a kid in the seventies who runs inside and says, you know, mommy, someone flew and saved my cat, and she gets smacked for, you know, making up stories or whatever. It's like, are they? It's kind of in your face if it's meant to be, you know, a sign of the times kind of thing. Well, uh, prepare. Which I'm sure it is, but it's yeah. prepare to have your mind know. blown. What's that? Prepare to have your mind blown because I think okay. what we saw in actuality was the origin story of Catwoman. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> I think that's why she becomes so obsessed with cats. Could be. And Could be. Uh, is turned into a criminal criminal by her mother's beatings. Right. Yep. I just cracked the code. You're welcome. Yeah, you did. You're welcome, Good Internet. Job. Good job. <laughs> it's probably on like 50 blogs already. Probably. <laughs> Anything you can think of, somebody's already thought of. Yeah. Bastards. So you want to talk about the uh, the interview? Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. Or do you have... Let me just check. Oh, yeah, we can go to that. Because my... Did you... I, the next note I have is uh, the whole thing about the action montage. Oh, okay, yeah. Was that... I mean, with uh, the uh, car yeah. chase and the boat. Yeah. Yeah. And was that, uh, was the Air Force One rescue part of that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's what I thought. Um, well, for the interview, the first thing I noticed was that uh, Lois has like a million dollar apartment. Oh, yeah. On a newspaper person's salary. I was kind of surprised. I mean, maybe newspaper writers made big bucks back then. I don't know. Uh, it, it, her parents looked pretty well to do in that train in the beginning, so it could yeah, be family money. That's true. I was just surprised at how, I mean, she had, like, a full-on rooftop. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, her rooftop garden was bigger than most apartments. <laughs> right. I was like, holy hell, okay. 
So I think that's why I never Super, thought about that. Superman's really into her for her money. Oh yeah. He's like, oh man, I could set my mom up for life. <laughs> yeah. All right. So yeah, we uh, get to the big uh, awkward interview scene where it's just in <laughs> not so veiled uh, flirting, I guess. Yeah, there's some pretty heavy-handed flirting, and it is awkward, but that scene is a lot of fun. Well, uh, let's start with your vital statistics. Are you married? Uh, no. No, not. Do you have a girlfriend? Uh, no, I don't, but, uh, if I did, Miss Lane, you'd be the first to know about it. And how big are you? How tall are you? Uh, about 6'4". Four. Four. Uh, well, um, uh, I assume then that the, the rest of your bodily function's normal? Sorry, I beg your pardon? Uh, is it true that uh, you can see through anything? Uh, yes, I can. Well, pretty much. Mm-hmm. What color underwear am I wearing? Hmm. Uh, um, I think I've heard that this is one of those scenes that if you audition for Superman, you and whoever they're auditioning for Lois Lane, you read this scene. Like This has become the Clark and Lois audition scene. Well, it's a good gauge of chemistry, I'd say. Yeah, um, I I like the like we were saying before with uh, Christopher Reeve playing, you know, Clark a certain way. I really like how he plays Kal El or, or Superman. You know, um, he's confident and it's it's just a complete one hundred and eighty from from Clark Kent. Um, he's too confident. He spills way too much information. That's true, but just I like the way he's like just casually sitting there in the chair and just you know, just the way he's responding. It's it's just I don't know. It's I can't quite put my finger on what it is about it that I like, but it just kind of goes back again to what I was saying about Christopher Reeve being a genius for playing these roles, you know, completely different. Um, but yeah, I do like the back and forth with the the answers to the questions and then you know her questions getting more flirty or awkwardly intimate, you know. Bodily function. <laughs> bodily functions, you know, what color underwear, like, because essentially she's saying, I know you can see through things, and now I want you to stare at my, you know, uh-huh. at, you know, at my un- at my underwear, <laughs> which essentially it's like, what's to stop him from looking further aside from him being a decent person, you know. Yeah. It's just a strange, like, to go from seeing through things to... Jumping to underwear is a weird... I think she was trying to maybe catch him off guard. Could have been, yeah. But then he catches her off guard by telling her after yeah. she gets away from the lead planter. Yeah, that he reveals. <laughs> I was like, oh, plot point. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, But yeah, um, she seems... At, like Before he shows up, she seems like you know, disappointed and... Yeah. Goes and starts drinking immediately. Uh, <laughs> right. Great sign. Uh, <laughs> and then he shows up. He's like, hey, baby, what's up? Just uh, You want to go for a ride? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the flying sequence. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't have a huge problem with it other than the inner monologue. Yeah, the poem is really strange. Oh, that was just I, awkward. And, yeah. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Can you read my mind? <laughs> oh, I thought it was like a Lionel Richie song for a second. Well, the thing was, is it was supposed to be her singing a song, but I guess like maybe the I, from what I read, they were like, well, it just didn't work, so we'll just have you, you know, say the lines instead of sing it. So I don't know if that was a maybe she has a terrible singing voice, you know, or maybe the idea of a song there just didn't work but yeah because they could use a anything. poem doesn't work much better no no not at all so and, and the whole like i i like the the two of them flying it's oh. it's a nice scene when she she when she lets go of him that's really weird yeah because it's not like he lets her go like it's not you know him it's not him like pulling a prank and dropping her you know it's she just you know I guess they get caught up in the moment and they don't realize that they're you know getting away from each other I guess but well I mean she inches away like yeah I mean it's a fairly long process of her getting right. further out of his grip so yeah, yeah. Um, 
I don't know if she thought she could coast on the air or something. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, it, it it was all right. I mean, I, I understood why they did it. It was just yeah. like a bonding kind of moment. Sure. Um, I'm always confused that like basically that the the interview or that that scene kind of ends with them returning. So when does when does she get all the info that she needs for her article? Well, he's talked about Krypton. Yeah, but then later when Lex is like reading the the details of the interview, like they have a lot more information oh, yeah. than what was given up, you know. So it's just kind of that that weird jump of of cuz it seems like we're shown the entire yeah. you know, interaction. So I mean, maybe she just one of those just writes other things like witnesses and yeah, maybe stories that people have of their experience, like the pilots in the Air Force One, or yeah, I I, uh, I, I, I think specifically just the details about Krypton. You know, <laughs> that whole thing. It's like where do those come from? Yeah. I, I like so. how Lex like is an expert. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that <laughs> on, um, on Krypton and how this rock will affect Kryptonians. Yeah. <laughs> It is a weird jump to think that his his planet, which exploded, would have irradiated, you know, fragments that would be poisonous to him. Like, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. That's a yeah. it's an interesting leap, but it it doesn't require you to linger on it, really. Uh, I mean, you, know? you already know it's kind of ridiculous to begin with. Sure. So it's just like, okay, let's just get past it. It is what it is. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I mean. Especially since Lex's knowledge is based on um, like an encyclopedia section in his library, <laughs> um, yeah. I'm very impressed with how much knowledge he has. Right. He doesn't even have uh, the internet. Right. What an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Just imagine what he could do with the internet. I know. Jesse Eisenberg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're. Um, yeah, I, I I love the library he has. It yeah. Seems like he can just find whatever he needs right there. <laughs> right. It's like, oh, look at this random dude holding a rock of kryptonite. <laughs> <laughs> it must it must be from uh, you know, his native planet. Yeah. yeah, and of course Kryptonians are deathly affected by this radiation that comes off of this yeah. rock cuz I know their physiology. <laughs> yeah. In the interview he says that the planet Krypton exploded in 1948. Ridiculous little freak took three years in a rocket ship to get to Earth. Fragments from the planet Krypton exploded and went into outer space. It is reasonable to assume that some of those particles of debris drifted to Earth. The level of specific radioactivity is so high to anyone from the planet Krypton, this substance is lethal. Uh, but, eh, whatever. It is what it is. Right, yeah. I'm not going to ding it too much because, I mean, it's yeah. kind of what the material gives you, I guess. Yeah, I did always like the uh, the way they treated kryptonite in uh, in Smallville. How it was like it was all over Smallville, like yeah. you know, because it's like the entire town got bombarded with all these fragments, you know. So I did like that aspect of it, you know. Yeah, but it seemed to give kids powers, right? Yeah. So so you get the freak of the week kind of episodes yeah. and. You know, all that stuff. So I, I always like that. So it's weird that kryptonite can give powers to normal humans, but I don't yeah. think that's ever brought up other than that android guy that runs on kryptonite. I mean, it came up a lot in the first couple seasons. Like I mean, in the like, first uh, a- other iterations, like uh, oh, oh, animated oh, okay. series. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't... Yeah, you know? no, it gives Metallo his yeah. energy source. Um, aside from that, I know it affects Lex eventually. It gives him cancer, I think. Uh, <laughs> Is that what like he, he, he has a, Well, like, he had a kryptonite ring, and so I think, like, he lost a hand, maybe? Because, oh. like, it rotted his hand away or something. Um, Not so smart. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I thought I remembered something about him being powered by a suit at one point. He definitely, yeah, Lex is pretty famous for wearing like an iron man suit yeah. um, but never had a helmet like or he'd have a clear glass helmet or whatever yeah. um but yeah he had like a, a purple and green iron man type suit that he would you know a little battle suit <laughs> which they might do in batman v superman there's <laughs> really? i think there's a to- there's a toy version 
maybe. Um, so, but that's never a clear indicator of what is going to be in the movie. But oh, that does remind me of something, though. Uh, What's that? Eisenberg's hair. Now I'm thinking yeah. it's a wig because I saw this movie. Right. <laughs> I think it is too. Because it looks horrible. <laughs> right. So now that I've seen this movie, I'm like, oh, well, Lex likes to play with different wigs. <laughs> Maybe he's doing the same thing. Yeah, I like the uh, the use of wigs. And it's really just Gene Hackman's real hair because mm-hmm. he refused to shave. Yeah. So they came up with the idea of, well, if they style his hair differently and make it appear that he's wearing a bunch of wigs. But but I like the notion that <laughs> that he's always got new a different hairstyle. Yeah, a different hair for every occasion. That's right. And uh, that bald cap is not noticeable at all at the end. <laughs> uh, yeah. At least it's a quick enough scene that they don't linger on his, you know. Yeah, I think they have better bald caps on SNL. Probably. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. I think the last part of this act that I want to talk about for me is the uh, the them acquiring the missiles. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was... Uh... Uh, Interesting. <laughs> I like we get like the the bumbling Otis music. It's like it's all tubas and <laughs> and like you know big drums when he's like you know fumbling his way through changing the codes on the missile. Yeah. And then we get the awesome scene with him. You know, all three of them in the van, and he's all excited about you know he did it. He did it. And then <laughs> Lex is like, not that I don't trust you, but. I don't trust you. What did you do? Yeah, I like how he uh, pulled the brand out and wrote it on his arm. Yeah. I wonder if that was a dig. <laughs> yeah. Was I, I like that he wore a nice, bright Hawaiian shirt instead oh, yeah. of camouflage in the woods. Right. When he's sneaking around the trees. I was like, oh, good choice. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing that, like, the only weird part about the scene is you've got, like, the, the Army and yeah. the Navy are apparently transporting these two rockets. Yeah. Is this on the same day? <laughs> like, it's it's weird because it jumps from one missile heist or, you know, whatever to the next one. Oh, yeah. It's like they've, Where he's they've got... got rig and... Yeah, the wardrobe change. Yeah. They've got new vehicles. They've got, you know... It's just a bizarre, like... That's the part I didn't get because he, I mean, did the code he put in send that one to Jersey? No, he specifically sent that one to Jersey or. So which one had the bogus Otis code? Because wouldn't one be going off in a yeah. random direction? I don't know. That is weird because one of them, obviously he needs to go to the San Andreas. Yeah. But then, yeah, that must mean the other one just happened to point at New Jersey. I guess. But see, I always took it like he specifically sent it there. Yeah, it would make the most sense to keep Superman from, like, if you throw it at New Mexico, and that gives Superman more, less distance right. to travel, so. Yeah. Um, and, or maybe maybe they managed to go back and fix the, I don't know, but. Because the way it was shot, it looked like they had somehow magically gotten a semi and fixed yes. Otis's problem. Like uh, Miss Tess Monger or whatever the hell her name is, fix the code for Otis. That's what it makes it look like because they shot it so bang bang. Well, but the 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 only difference is the first one was all army guys and the second one was uh, all navy guys. So it was definitely two completely different rockets that they did time codes yeah. or changed the the coordinates for. Um. Which is why she was given the task of doing that second time since Otis, you know, screwed it up the first time. And nobody <laughs> checked the coordinates before firing the damn thing? Right. <laughs> well, I, I get the sense that they were fired, you know, way before they were supposed to. Because hmm. as soon as they launch, I think unexpectedly, everyone's instantly like, why are they launching, you know? Okay, I thought they just freaked so, out because they went the wrong direction. <laughs> no, nah, I, I think it's just the whole launch, you know... From the get go was was unplanned. Gotcha. Um, but how weird is it when uh, we get the the awesome car flip that Lex, you know, radio remote controls. Yeah. Um, and then you have Miss Tessmacher laying <laughs> on the ground. The army comes up to revive her. Yeah. Vigorous chest that, massage. 
Yeah, vigorous chest massage, and <laughs> by the looks of it, she'll need some mouth to mouth too. <laughs> and it's just that creepy. Yeah. Like, essentially, we're led to believe that she just gets felt up and molested for <laughs> who knows how long. Long enough for Otis to change some time codes. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, so that's yeah. Uh, well, you know, that's a woman's job, right? Yeah, that's that. You know, that casual molestation humor that yeah. the seventies are so so well known for. Uh, let's see. I think I think that's about all I had really until it gets yeah. to the um, dog whistle communication, right? Which yeah, is, that's gets pretty much the end of Act Two. Yeah, and I like that. Lex was able to communicate that way. Yeah. Hey, this is Travis, and this is where we're going to end this episode. We're splitting the episode here at the end of Act 2. In the meantime, reach out to us on Facebook or Twitter. We are at Real Comic Heroes. Let us know your thoughts on Superman. Join us next time for the conclusion of Superman the Movie.